afternoon to all. Um, my name is Al Hassan. Um, I've had the opportunity to work uh, within the CTN since its inception as a community treatment program representative and more recently as the node coordinator for the Pacific Region node. I'm currently working as a trainer for the um, Pacific Southwest Addiction Training Techno uh, Transfer Center uh, here at UCLA. And my co-presenter today is uh, uh, Dr. Suzette Glasner-Edwards. Hi, I'm Suzette Glasner-Edwards. I'm a clinical psychologist and a clinical researcher here at UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Program. Um, my research focuses on the treatment of substance use disorders and psychiatric comorbidity uh, using mindfulness, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and motivational intervention techniques. I've worked a little bit with the CTN doing clinical supervision for some of the trials that we ran out of UCLA and I have a research portfolio testing uh, behavioral treatments, both face-to-face -face and technology-assisted uh, treatments uh, for substance users with medical and psychiatric problems. Excellent. Thank you, Suzette. Okay, so today um, we're going to give you a very brief uh, overview of CBT. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about functional analysis and how we might use that uh, uh, in, in, during the course of a session. Um, we're going to describe the role of the counselor and also outline a CBT session. And then I'm going to hand it over to um, Suzette so that she can provide you an overview of mindfulness. So basically, CBT is a form of talk therapy. I mean, we use it. Um, it's, it's used both in mental health as well as substance use. Um, uh, more recently, we've, we've used it uh, uh, in, in some of the CTN trials um, that, that Suzette has provided supervision for. Um, it's used to encourage individuals and support individuals to help them stop using initially and then help them to um, basically uh, keep themselves from using harmful drugs over the course of, uh, of their recovery. Um, we provide skills. Um, uh, a skill set basically to help the individuals recognize sort of aspects of their drug use that may not be, they may not fully be aware of and help them to both reduce and, and, uh, and maintain their abstinence. Now CBT is also basically um, uh, utilized as a, as a relapse prevention strategy and during the course of this conversation I think basically what we'll do is we'll use those two both relapse prevention and CBT interchangeably. As I mentioned previously, it's, it's really looked to prevent the occurrence of, of lapses to drug use and then pr actually to prevent any lapse from uh, uh, escalating into a, a full-blown relapse. So the foundation is, is really in social learning theory and, and really what we look to do is provide uh, concepts of, of addiction um, that our patients may not be aware of. Um, many of our patients have been through uh, uh, treatment repeatedly, so some of them may be familiar with the concepts of, of, of addiction and, and how it, it really is a brain disease and others may not. We look to help individuals to develop new skills, to not use drugs, to understand their environment and how their environment uh, plays a key role um, in, in their use or potential use, and also individuals within their, in their environment. The, the, the critical thing about CBT is it takes practice. I mean, our patients are very, very good at um, uh, obtaining and using drugs and figuring out, you know, um, uh, sort of, 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 of ways to interact with their, in, in their environment as a means to obtain and use drugs. However, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult for them um, to, 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 to basically master some of the skills that um, will ultimately help them become uh, sober and continue uh, to maintain their sobriety over the course of, uh, of a period of time. CBT is it's, uh, well suited for you know, clinical programs, both outpatient and inpatient. Um, it's it's an evidence-based practice. If you go onto the NREP uh, website, you can see that there's a number of CBT um, 
uh, uh, interventions that have been studied and empirically, that are empirically based, including the matrix model. Um, CBT is structured. It's very goal-oriented. It's focused on, on the current situation that, that the individual is, is, is facing. Um, we, we try not to, we try not to sort of relive past experiences, even though we do recognize that those past experiences and trauma can be uh, crucial to helping an individual not use. For right now, what we're looking to do in the, in the, in the, uh, is, is to basically help individuals to stop their use and to, to maintain, you know, some sort of sobriety so that they can go back and take a look at some of the other things that may have contributed to their initial use. Um, it's flexible, as I mentioned. It can, it can be used both in an individual format as well as a group format, um, inpatient, outpatient. Um, it, one of the, the fascinating things more recently, Kathleen Carroll um, at, at Yale has, has uh, uh, been utilizing a computer-based technology for CBT. Um, I have some references for that. I do know that Dr. Glasner Edwards is using a texting form of, of uh, CBT uh, utilizing smartphones, and, and she can maybe tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, basically, early on, the, the focus uh, is, is on you know, behavioral change, um, helping individuals to recognize you know, that they can engage in non-drug-related behaviors um, avoid in, while avoiding individuals and situations that um, could trigger them or lead to or, or lead to drug use. Now, just a caveat there. While initially it, we really do, you know, tend to focus on on the behavioral th um, uh, aspects of, of their recovery, we, we don't forget that there is the cognitive piece and and you know the, uh, our attention to the you know developing cognitive skills um, really goes through. Out the whole course of the trial, our whole course of the trial, I'm thinking research, but the whole course of, of their intervention. Um, however, more of the cognitive strategies are, are incorporated later during the course of, uh, of, of their, their treatment. We help individuals, um, you know, plan out their day through, through scheduling, recognizing, you know, high-risk situations to, you know, and, and teaching them how to avoid those situations. And if they find themselves in trouble, basically, you know, figuring out, uh, out a way to, to get out of those situations, whether it's um, with, with, uh, with family or friends or, um, you know, whether they find themselves in a situation where people are using drugs and they hadn't anticipated. Um, as, as I mentioned, you know, in the later phases of recovery, the emphasis is more on the cognitive part. Um, you know, we teach individuals, you know, more about addiction and how addiction, you know, impacts their, their, their thought process and, and how addiction really is a, a, a brain disease. Um, we talk to them about conditioning and triggers and craving. Um, early on, we actually do spend a fair amount of time on thought stopping. Um, it's, it's really one of the early recovering skills that, that we try to train individuals to um, become fairly proficient at, to recognize um, you know, when, when they're triggered, um, what in their environment, but whether it's, uh, you know, what their external triggers are and how to deal with those external triggers, as well as recognizing in internal triggers. So um, briefly, I'll, the, the five W's of the functional analysis really are time periods when an individual uses, where they're using, sort of what was going on, why, why they were using. Um, you know, the, you know it's, it's important to go through these steps with our, our patients so that they be, can become more aware of sort of what aspects of their life, of their environment, really contribute to their, uh, to their use. More often than not, they don't recognize what these things are, and it's really important for us to help point those out. Um, when we do end up... Um, uh, addressing these the, the five W's, there's a number of questions that, that we can help, um, and in fact, they're open-ended questions that uh, that we can that we can ask our participants, our patients, um, to sort of help them through this process. So, like, what was going on before you were using? 
um, where did you obtain the drugs, you know, who did you use, you know, what, what was going on after you used, and, and where were you when, when you began to think about using. More often than not, our patients aren't aware of these things that are going on in, in their environment or what the thought processes are that, that actually led up to their use. And by, by discussing these with them, they become, you know, more aware of, of sort of internal feelings, internal, you know, emotional states that are, that are occurring uh, in relation to their drug use, as well as what the environmental cues are that, that may have caused them to, to use, uh, you know, on a, on a particular occasion. This is one of the forms that we use in terms of functional analysis, and it's, it's incredibly helpful to sort of walk the par patient through these and have them write these things down. You know, basically in a number of the programs that I've worked at, including the Matrix Institute, we utilize manuals that an individual can um, work, you know, uh, more of a workbook, I guess, in a manual uh, that individuals can work from uh, during the course of their treatment, uh, treatment episode. Um, sometimes we provide those that they can take home and, and uh, work from home, but as well we keep those, uh, those manuals on site that they can use as a reference. So in the event that something, you know, um, you know that they have a setback in, 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 uh, in their, uh, their treatment, we can go back and look at, at some of the interventions that they may have incorporated to help them stay drug-free in the past. Um, so the role of the clinician here is, you know, it, they're, they're very active and, and more directive probably than you would find in some of the other uh, interventions, including MI. Um, you end up being a teacher and a coach. It really is a partnership, um, as, as would be described sort of like in, in the MI spirit. Um, you know, the, 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 the counselor really has to create an environment of respect, of trust, so that the individual will, um, will, will basically feel comfortable uh, with providing, you know, some intimate in information regarding their drug use and, and other aspects of their life. Um, we have to strike a balance between being a really good listener and, and asking questions, you know, particularly open-ended questions. Um, we end up being a teacher, providing some information and, and skills that, that, that will, you know, repeatedly go over to help the individual um, sort of be able to grasp these things. As we know, our patients are cognitively impaired, and so, you know, having, having gone over, um, whether it's triggers or thought stopping or um, any, any number of concepts in CBT repeatedly is, is crucial. We also have to be fairly flexible, um, but understand that we cannot allow each individual session to become more of a crisis management um, uh, session or, or to deal with crisis as we, you know, on a regular basis, as we know our, our, uh, uh, the lives of the patients that we work with are, are somewhat disoriented and, and you know, in, in that aspect, you know, we, we have to really keep, keep them sort of in line um, in, in when we look to um, complete uh, uh, the, the, the course of a Oh, excuse me, the course of, a, um, uh, of, of one of our sessions. Um, positive reinforcement and affirmations are, are crucial um, and, and to providing our, our patients. More often than not, we're probably the only source our, um, of, uh, of affirmations that our, that our clients end up, uh, end up getting. Um, it's important for us to be non-judgmental. And, and utilize the, the, the core skills in motivational interviewing, including um, asking open-ended questions, um, affirmations, you know, uh, uh, both simple and, and complex uh, uh, reflections as well as summaries. So generally how we would, would structure a, a session, um, we, it, it, if it's an individual session, um, generally we're not, uh, we don't have a, a full 60 minutes, but we might have a 50 minute session We'll break it out into thirds. We'll generally check in with the individual for about five minutes, you know, finding out how things were, what their drug or alcohol use was like um, uh, during, uh, since, since the last time we saw them. Uh, we don't want to be non-directive. I mean, we have a purpose generally to the session, and we really want to move forward with it, but we don't want to be so rigid 
that that it it uh, it feels contrived or as they mentioned machine-like. Um, so we set the agenda um, by you know as as I mentioned having them check in. Um, we get an understanding of you know how they how they felt about their the, the homework that was assigned previously. Um, we talk about their craving and any potential high-risk situations that they found themselves in since the last time we saw them, and and also find out how they you know how they managed any of these any of the craving or high-risk situations um, since that last time, uh, last session. We introduce a, a, a discussion uh, a, a topic. We usually spend about a third of the session on a specific topic, you know, whether it's, um, you know, and, and, the, and the topics can be any number of things, you know, uh, whether it's reviewing internal or external triggers, um, you know, completing a, a trigger chart, talking about, you know, 12-step uh, meetings or 12-step introductions, uh, looking at, uh, at, at, at downtime and, and how they spent their downtime. So. Um, and, and in that process, it's, it's important for us to relate the topic to what's going on in, the, in, their, in their life at that, at that time and make sure that they really understand uh, the topic and, and how it, you know, its importance and relevance to their uh, both continuing and maintaining their sobriety. And then, of course, practice. I mean, it's, it's crucially important for, for them to continue to practice these skills. Um, the, the final 20 minutes, basically, we will um, end up uh, scheduling their time until the next time we see them. Uh, we'll assign a practice exercise. Um, if we haven't already, we'll review the, the, the practice exercise from, from the, uh, the last session. Um, you know, uh, I stress the, you know, reviewing the, uh, the, the exercise, that, you know, the homework that we sent them home with. If we don't attend to that, they're going to, basically look upon it as it's something that's irrelevant and it's not important for them to do. So anytime that we provide them a homework assignment, it's really going to be important for us to review aspects of that homework and, and, and to help them sort of um, uh, see the relevance in, in, in the homework as to their being able to maintain and uh, maintain the recovery. So the challenges for the clinician is really to stay focused, um, really to, you know, you have to manage your time incredibly well. We're not looking to conduct, you know, psychotherapy. Um, you know, it, it is a very, very directive sort of, sort of style. Um, but yet we do have to be, you know, uh, flexible. And one of the things, um, you know, in, in, in terms of the, the time frame, when you have a group of eight or ten um, individuals it's going to be important for you to manage your time well and to be able to give each one of the individuals some time to, to you know, present and to, to talk about what's going on in, in their life, but also to, you know, um, uh, to share how they might see the, the relevance of the, the, the topic uh, that's been discussed and how that might impact um, in a positive way their recovery. So um, I, I have some references here for you. Um, certainly, Judy Beck, and, and you know, is is uh, one of the foremost uh, CBT therapists these days. Um, there's the evidence-based practice website, the NREP website, and and Dr. Carroll's CBT for a CBT uh, website. I would encourage you to take a look at all of those, as well as to go on to the CSAT website. Um, the Matrix model has a as a uh, is a great resource in, in terms of the both counselor uh, and patient manuals. And uh, at this point, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Suzette Glasner-Edwards. Thank you, Al. That was a great overview of CBT in a short period of time. Uh, I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about mindfulness-based relapse prevention, uh, which is a newer strategy in the uh, treatment of substance use disorders, and we've recently completed a pilot clinical trial that's now um, under consideration for publication, and I'm going to be showing you some of the results from our trial and talking a little bit about uh, how, uh, how and why we would apply mindfulness-based techniques to uh, addicted populations 
So I just want to acknowledge my um, several wonderful collaborators that I've had on this project, um, as well as the ISAP Clinical Research Center staff, and this was uh, generously supported by NIDA. Uh, so this first slide is just to highlight the way that uh, the mind and body connection has been such an such a popular uh, emphasis. There's a lot of buzz about mind and body, and there has been for several years. Uh, mindfulness has been of interest to address a number of different types of psychological and psychiatric problems. Um, so its application to addictive uh, disorders is newer. Um, what mindfulness is? Well, it's, a, it's, it's more of a life approach than it is a therapy technique, I would say. Um, if it's really adopted properly and uh, learned uh, in the way that it's intended, it's, it's not something that someone with an addiction would use only when they're feeling uncomfortable or having a craving, but it would be more of a day-to-day, moment-to-moment life um, orientation. It's a particular, it's defined uh, as a particular way of paying attention to the present moment uh, on purpose and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. So that's uh, it's a little bit lengthy, but if we unpack what all that means, um, it's really guiding your attention purposefully to what's happening right here and right now. So some of you, as you're listening to our presentation, may be looking at your emails, uh, not to accuse anybody, or maybe thinking about what you have to do an hour from now or the next meeting that you're going to. And if you're practicing mindfulness, you're just listening to the sound of my voice and trying to take in the words that I'm saying and understand them um, and really just try uh, to stay right here and right now uh, tuned in to what you're experiencing as you're listening to me um, and tuned in to whatever thoughts that you might be having that might be interfering with you, uh, paying attention in the moment, and then just gently shifting your attention back to the present moment whenever that happens. Um, so. How does this approach reduce stress? Uh, well, there, there's not only this component, component of paying attention to the present moment, but some of the ways that we train people to do that is to begin by focusing, learning how to focus on their body. So we have a number <clears throat> of meditation exercises that pertain to paying attention and tuning into what's happening in different parts of the body. And then there are breathing meditations uh, that are all about connecting with the experience of breathing. Um, and so as you practice those meditations in theory um, and in evidence, uh, you get better and better at focusing your attention. Uh, so the cognitive focus of mindfulness is on seeing and accepting things as they are without attempting to change them. And if you think about how that applies to substance use, it's really a complementary approach to what Al was talking about with CBT where there is a, quite a bit of emphasis on identifying maladaptive or irrational ways of thinking about drugs and alcohol and changing it, whereas with mindfulness, you can complement that with an approach that focuses on accepting things the way that they are, accepting, uh, observing some of the thoughts you have without necessarily t trying to change them, but also knowing that they don't have to control your behavior necessarily. So as far as why we would think of targeting stress in substance users, well, for one thing, we know that emotional stress uh, contributes to drug relapse. It's a major trigger. Uh, and then we also know from um, brain imaging studies that substance users have deficits in their ability to process and regulate stress. So if a substance user is caught in a stressful situation, <clears throat> what the evidence shows is that they may have a harder time accessing um, psychologically or cognitively a strategy that would be healthy to cope in that situation, cope with that situation. So their more immediate kind of reflexive impulse uh, is to use substances in response to stress because that's something that's been learned and very well rehearsed over time. So if we can target uh, stress-induced craving among substance users and also what we call stress reactivity, and stress reactivity is just basically how stressed do you get when you're exposed to something stressful? People really vary in terms of how they react physically and emotionally to a stressor, how worked up they get, how much their heart rate increases. Well, mindfulness has been shown to reduce stress reactivity so that you don't spike as high on measures of stress in the body like cortisol, 
uh, when you have learned mindfulness-based strat strategies. So that was some of our thinking about why mindfulness would be useful in, in, um, in addicted populations. So what would it provide? Well, first of all, skills for coping with craving and for tolerating other forms of what we call psychological discomfort that often precede a relapse. Uh, and then second, it would be a way of interrupting that conditioned behavioral sequence that leads from craving to relapse. And what I mean by that is if you've had clients before whom you ask, well, what happened before you relapsed? And they say, well, I don't know. I just one minute I was upset or, or one minute I was having a craving and the next moment I was using. And it's hard for them to sort of unpack what happened from that first point when they wanted to use to when they used. Um, so with mindfulness, because you're teaching them to pay attention in the present moment of the way that their psychological experience is unfolding, um, they'll get a little bit better at attending to how that process uh, develops, and then that way we can interrupt it more easily. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, these are skills that they don't contradict CBT, but they really complement it. So the way that, that um, I would explain most straightforwardly how that is, is that CBT focuses on challenging the content of one's thoughts, so identifying and challenging dysfunctional thoughts, whereas mindfulness is really more about altering your cognitive process. So the process of shifting your attention away from the present um, is a focus of mindfulness. The process of paying attention, um, the process of a craving and of tolerating discomfort. So mindfulness-based relapse prevention actually builds on uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Actually, the very first um, application of mindfulness was to stress, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and just because of, in the interest of time, not going through all the history with mindfulness, but it was initially a stress reduction program that's been used for a variety of different types of clinical co populations. It began with people with uh, chronic pain, but it's also been helped to use people deal with just everyday stress. Uh, it's been used in people with mood disorders, uh, ADHD, just to name a few. And from mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, developed mindfulness-based cognitive therapy that combined mindfulness techniques with cognitive therapy for depression. And a number of studies showed that it prevented relapse to major depression in people who had had multiple major depressive disorders, uh, mul multiple major depressive episodes, that is. And then from mindfulness-based cognitive therapy developed uh, mindfulness-based relapse prevention, which combines, just as it sounds, techniques of mindfulness training with relapse prevention CBT, uh, just as Al discussed it. Uh, and uh, the relapse prevention piece really focuses on identifying triggers and enabling the patients to monitor their internal reactions to triggers. So the idea is, as they become more aware of what tr how triggers affect their mind and body, then they can actually, rather than react to triggers and stress and negative emotions, they can respond mindfully. And so this distinction is made between reacting, which is sort of going on impulse, and responding, which is with the knowledge of what they're experiencing, having explored it in a sort of objective and uh, uh, methodical way, then stepping back and making a mindful choice. So in terms of the evidence for mindfulness-based relapse prevention, there are several studies. The body of literature is now growing. There was an initial efficacy study that showed um, that it was effective as a continuing care approach um, to individuals with alcohol and substance use disorders. Then there was a second study that compared uh, mindfulness to CBT with alcohol, those with alcohol or cocaine dependence, and both of the treatments were equally effective, which is a good finding, because if mindfulness can perform just as well as CBT, plus it can provide some added benefits of reducing stress reactivity, then we know that it, it is sort of up there with our, our uh, most um, potentially effective approaches. Um, there are also a few more recent studies that I don't have up there, but um, Sarah Bone and her group did a larger uh, randomized trial in 2014 that was most uh, recently published that, that compared CBT alone to mindfulness plus CBT to mindfulness. Um, and also found beneficial longer-term effects and six months post-treatment uh, of their intervention uh, for substance use outcomes. 
So as far as the goals of mindfulness-based relapse prevention, as I mentioned, you want to increase awareness of triggers. You want to interrupt that habitual um, sequence of behaviors, as I mentioned, teaching the, the um, clients to respond rather than react uh, to their emotions with use um, and other triggers. Um, to recognize what we refer to as automatic pilot, that's sort of um, what mindfulness really aims to do is to get us out of that sort of automatic mode that we all fall into where we're doing a lot of things without thinking. We drive without thinking about what it feels like to grip the steering wheel and push, our, push the gas pedal because we're planning the rest of our day when we're driving or we're having a conversation. Um, we, a lot of things we do in the moment in this mode that's called automatic pilot, and where that becomes problematic for a substance user is that they're coping with life on autopilot, and their auto version of autopilot uh, involves repetitive substance use. So we're teaching them to recognize automatic pilot and then shift to mindful observation and response. We're also teaching them to tolerate, learn to tolerate discomfort. That's the whole idea of accepting and not necessarily changing and then accepting the present experience without fixing it. Now that doesn't mean that this therapy is one in which you don't try to fix or resolve any problems. It's just that you get, you grow accustomed to that experience of sitting with uh, uncomfortable experiences rather than having to do something about it to avoid it um, or escape it, which is largely what self-medicating um, using substances really means. Uh, so, uh, Urge surfing, which is also a concept in CBT, but this is something that's used in, in mindfulness. Um, so there's sort of a place where CBT and I think mindfulness sort of blend. Um, the idea is to observe and accept um, the uh, experience of an urge rather than trying to fight or control it. Another mindfulness skill um, is called inquiry, and that is where you teach the clients how to tell the difference between what we refer to as direct experience. We ask them, what is your direct experience right now as we're doing this meditation or this mindfulness exercise? Their direct experience is their sensations in their body when they're doing the exercise, the thoughts that are running through their mind, it's the feelings that they have. And then we want them to distinguish that from their reaction to the experience. So the reaction can be an idea they have about the experience, a judgment they have about the experience. And where this applies to um, addiction recovery is in that Sometimes when a person experiences a craving, they pass judgment on themselves for experiencing the craving. I shouldn't feel that way, or uh, if I keep on feeling that way, this way, I'm, I'm never going to recover. What we're trying to teach them is not to judge themselves for the nature of their experience, but just to observe their experience with curiosity. And that increases their awareness of their more knee-jerk kind of reflexive reactions and keeps them uh, focused on the present. Uh, one of the things that we ask them is whether the process is familiar. If they say, yeah, I, I found myself, my mind was wandering during that exercise, and, or I was, I was judging myself for the feelings that I was having, or I was making judgments about the exercise and thinking how silly it is or something like that. We ask them if that process is familiar because often the mind repeats itself and they end up having these experiences that might remind, we might help them to sort of connect the dots where yeah, you do that during this exercise. You also judge yourself in other life situations um, and helping them to learn how they can apply mindfulness more broadly. There's this quote here that says that this is what minds do. People often judge themselves for their ability to be mindful as they're learning mindfulness strategies. So we sort of reassure them when they say, well, my mind wandered off during that meditation. I couldn't focus. And we say, well, that's just what minds do. You're just learning about how your mind works. And it's okay if it wanders off as long as you can pay attention and recognize, oh, my mind has wandered off. Let me try and put it back in the present. This is an exercise I just wanted you all to be aware of because I found it very helpful in a therapeutic context. Um, it's called the sober breathing spaces, and this is where you can teach clients to do a little mindful exercise that only takes a couple of minutes. Um, so the acronym uh, is SOBER, and what that stands for is, so if a if we want to help someone make a mindful decision um, and they find themselves in autopilot and having one of their automatic reactions, whether that reaction is to uh, want to use or if that reaction is to feel very stressed or overwhelmed, whatever it is that they're doing that they, they, they do repetitively, repetitively in life, we try to interrupt that by teaching them to stop. So when you're in a stressful or risky situation, 
uh, just remember to stop, slow down, and check in with yourself about what's happening. And that's the first step uh, in stepping out of automatic pilot. So O is for observe. So observe the sensations that are happening in your body. So you stop, you observe what's happening, observe your emotions, observe your sensations, and just notice as much as you can about what's happening right here, right now. And then the breathe. The B is for breath or breathe. Um, so you, you gather your attention and bring it to your breath. And then once you do that for a few moments, just tune into your your your, um, your breathing, uh, and the inhale and the exhale, just for a couple of seconds. Then you expand. The E is for expand your awareness to include the rest of your body and the situation. So beyond the breath, seeing if you can gently hold all of what's going on in your awareness. And then having done that, and that only takes a minute or maybe two, uh, then you are in the R uh, phase, and that's respond rather than react. Okay, so now respond mindfully with an awareness of what's truly happening in the situation, what you need to do, and ideally your response is, is connected with self-compassion, so how you can best take care of yourself. Whatever is happening in your mind and body, the idea is you still have a choice in how you respond. You don't have to do something that's self-destructive. Uh, we've sort of gone over this. Um, so uh, a couple of other skills are balancing, acceptance, and action. So as I mentioned before, the, the acceptance concept, concept is not to convey the idea that anything that's wrong in your life, you should just accept it. Um, it's a balance. So you can accept uh, and tolerate discomfort without crumbling, without having to use or do something self-destructive, but you can also act skillfully um, to change things that you are able to change um, with a sort of mindful, mindful accepting uh, approach in the backdrop. Um, another skill that we teach in mindful is called seeing thoughts just as thoughts rather than as truth, and that also overlaps with uh, things that we teach in CBT. Um, and then we, we help people to understand the role of thoughts in the relapse cycle, again, emphasizing that thoughts don't have to control your behaviors. You can picture your thoughts like leaves on a stream and you can let them float away. There's a meditation that pertains just to this and just observe what they are um, rather than accepting them as truth um, and uh, allowing them to always drive your behavior even when they're unhealthy thoughts. Um, so this is actually just a little bit of data that I'm going to uh, present from our trial of mindfulness-based uh, relapse prevention for, for stimulant users. Um, so we had an eight-week course of mindfulness, and we did uh, mindfulness compared to a health education control group uh, in, in participants who were also at the same time receiving contingency management. Um, so they all got contingency management for 12 weeks, and then they were randomly assigned to, in addition, either have an eight-week uh, mindfulness-based relapse prevention course or this control group. And what we found was, uh, in this slide, uh, when you compare the mindfulness to the control condition as far as their psychiatric severity, we found that those in the mindfulness condition improved significantly from week zero to week 12 and then our one month follow up at week 16, whereas those in the controlled condition stayed relatively the same. Um, and then when we looked at the number and the proportion of negative urine uh, drug screens uh, for each phase of the study where we had a contingency management lead-in that was four weeks that was only contingency management, and then we had an intervention phase where they were getting contingency management plus mindfulness or contingency management plus the control condition. Um, you can see that generally they all performed the same. So we thought, well, maybe mindfulness um, didn't really add any benefit uh, beyond what you get in contingency management, which is a pretty powerful intervention. So we were asking a lot of mindfulness in that situation. But then when we looked at subgroups of people, of stimulant users who also had anxiety and depressive disorders, then we actually found that they were the ones who benefited more from mindfulness training than those, uh, those who uh, were assigned to the health education control. So those with major depressive disorder who got mindfulness were actually less likely to have positive urines over the course of treatment compared to the ones uh, who had health ed. And we saw pretty much the same pattern with uh, generalized anxiety disorder, that those with generalized anxiety disorder who received mindfulness training were less likely than those who received health education to have positive urines. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, mindfulness involves cultivating awareness of one's moment-to-moment -moment experience in a non-judgmental way. Um, these interventions have been studied for the treatment of a range of medical and psychiatric illnesses and have most recently shown 
great promise in the treatment of substance abuse uh, using this blended CBT and mindfulness uh, manualized intervention called mindfulness-based relapse prevention. Um, basic skills that can be taught without a formal program of mindfulness include awareness of the here and now, awareness of one's breath, and balancing acceptance and action in risky situations. Um, in our uh, pilot study of mindfulness for stimulant users, we found that those stimulant users who have clinical depression and anxiety benefit the most from this approach in terms of its effect on their stimulant use. We also found that it effectively reduced negative uh, emotions, so I didn't have time to show those slides, but we found positive effects on uh, depression and anxiety and the ability to regulate negative emotions, psychiatric impairment and severity of addiction. Um, and we are also looking at mechanisms of change, so what's driving some of those changes. We have been finding um, that, as I mentioned, um, these individuals who benefit from mindfulness are showing better emotional regulation, um, are not suppressing their thoughts as much as they're allowing their thoughts to be there, uh, and we're continuing to investigate that. So um, with that, I will uh, conclude my presentation and open it up for questions. Fabulous. Thank you, Al and uh, uh, Suzette, for that information. We do have a question in the queue, and it asks uh, Jean Rosner, could you please give some examples of practice-based homework for the patient? And I think that's for Al's section on uh, CBT. Okay. All right. Um, great job, Suzette. Um, so, so, Jean, this is a really good question. So, generally, each one of our sessions, um, is structured uh, a, around a, a specific topic. So, for instance, let's just say um, one of the topics was boredom. Uh, basically, what we would have individuals do is, you know, we would we would address sort of how boredom um, would, you know, potentially lead to somebody using drugs and and a potential relapse. We'd have them identify certain activities that that they might like to pursue or things that they used to enjoy doing prior to their, their using drugs, and then actually planning um, between now and the next time that they come into a session, um, what are some of the activities that they might do? And, uh, and, and we would incorporate that into a schedule that they could take home with them so that when they return, we would address the last topic. In this instance, the last topic was boredom and sort of how they handled boredom and whether or not they actually followed through with some of the things that, that they indicated that they would on their schedule. So there's, there's basically a homework assignment that's actually attached to each one of the topics that's covered um, in a specific section. I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Al. Um, a copy of this presentation recording and materials will be posted to the CTN Dissemination Library. So you will have that in about 10 days. And we would encourage everyone to please come back next month, November 11th, to discuss electronic medical health records, common data elements for substance use disorders. We'll start at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. So thank you so much, Al and Suzette. Again, thank you. And if we get more interest in this topic uh, and continuing the discussion, we will invite you back again. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. You're welcome. That will end our call today. Thank you. <laughs>